Well, for much of Jesus' ministry, when he walked here on planet Earth, he downplayed his true identity, didn't he? And though he revealed it sort of vaguely to his team, and the details of the plan, the mission that he was on, nobody had any kind of real clue how Jesus was going to accomplish his mission. And in order to successfully do exactly what the Father had sent him to do, which was rescuing mankind, humanity, from the ravages of sin and the devil, he had to give himself as a human sacrifice. And it had to happen in just the right way, at the hands of just the right people, at exactly the right time, and in just exactly the right place. Now think about the enormity of that task. How do you influence people in just the right way so that everything happens just as you want? Now what we saw in the first part, or what we see in the first part of, of Luke chapter 22, is really Jesus setting into motion the final portions of his plan. Now, to do this, he uses the motivations of both humans, Judas and the religious leaders, and the motivations of supernatural beings, Satan, to do exactly what he wants, to do his bidding. So let's see how this plays out. Now initially I was planning to go much further into this chapter in this message, but uh, there is a, a richness here and I think some things that we can really take away that can help us practically in our everyday lives. So we're only going to go through verse 6 this time. But let's begin in verse 1. The festival of unleavened bread, which is called Passover, was drawing near. Now you've probably heard the word Passover before. It's a pretty common word. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is not so much. So let me just explain a little bit of how that came about. Because there's a tremendous significance to this festival and to the Passover that, that works into Jesus' mission. And what we have to do is first travel back in time in the history of the nation of Israel. Now God called a guy named Abram. And Abram lived in the area of Ur of the Chaldeans, which is in southeastern modern-day Iraq. Abram was a pagan. Abram didn't worship Yahweh. Abram didn't know Yahweh from Adam. That was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> God came to Abram and he said, Abram, get up. You're going on a trip. I want you to head south. And I want you to go to the land of Canaan. And, believe it or not, Abram said, well, okay, that's what we're going to do. And so he headed out, and that was the first of many times that God spoke to Abram and that Abram obeyed what God told him to do. Now, God would eventually give Abram a new name, the name that we're most familiar with, and that's Abraham. And he told Abraham that his descendants... Through his descendants, God would bring a tremendous blessing to the entire earth. That's found in Genesis chapters 15 and 17. So Abraham had kids. That's a miracle in and of itself. And his grandson Jacob took his family, they're living now in Canaan, and left for Egypt because there was a tremendous famine in the land of Canaan that God had given them. Now they were initially welcomed into Egypt and given a plum spot the best of the land, but the kings, the pharaohs of that place were replaced and eventually a pharaoh came up who uh, didn't know anything about how these people had been brought into the land. And so pharaoh put the Israelites into slavery and they actually were responsible for building many of the cities and the monuments that tourists go and visit today, built by slaves that the Israelis became in Egypt. And so the people of Israel cried out to God for rescue. And God sent them a man named Moses. Now Moses performed miracles. He caused a set of plagues to inflict the people of Egypt in order to get them to release the Israelites. But none of the plagues worked. And of course God knew that they really wouldn't. And so he brought about one last plague. And in this plague, the firstborn of every human and animal family would die on a particular night. 
to protect the Israelites, God called them to do two things. One, to pick a perfect lamb and kill that lamb, roast it, and eat it in a special ceremony. Then they were to take some of the blood of that lamb and they were to apply it on their, uh, the doors of their house. They were to put it on the, the two side beams that were holding up the house and they were to put it on the top of the, of the, uh, of the door posts as well. And so what would happen, of course, is the blood would drip down off of that and it would hit down on the threshold as well. And if, if the significance of the placement of that blood hasn't hit you yet, if you draw a line down between those, it forms the shape of a cross. So they put this blood on the door, and then two, they were to remove all leaven from their house. Now, leaven is what they used. Today, we use something called yeast. It's very similar, but they called it leaven in, in that day. is a little bit different. They were to remove all leaven from their homes. Um, they couldn't have any yeast or leaven in their house for an entire week. And then you find this in Exodus chapter 12. So, if the blood was present on the doorway and there was no leaven in the house, then the angel of death would pass over their homes when it came to be that one night where the firstborn of every family would die in this plague. And thus, that's where we get the term Passover. Passover. Now, we'll get to the significance of the blood of that lamb when we go deeper into the chapter next time. The idea of removing that leaven from the house is very symbolic because leaven in the Bible is most of the time used as a symbol for sin. So you, the whole idea here is that to deal with sin, which is thinking, speaking, or acting in a way that God would not think, speak, or act. So dealing with sin and escaping the result of sin, which is death. That's what's going on when we're talking about Passover. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread began this yearly celebration of God passing over the Israelite homes and freeing them from slavery to Egypt. The next morning, Pharaoh said, when all the firstborn had died all across Egypt, Egypt, except in the place where the Israelis had put the blood of the lamb on the doors of their homes, he said, get up and get out of here. And so that was the final straw. That was the thing that broke Israel free from slavery to the land of Egypt. And so the Jews were told each year to return to Jerusalem for this feast, which is at, at the point in Luke 22 here is about to take on its real Meaning, it's real fulfillment because all of that stuff that happened back in Egypt, although it was really happening at that time, was simply a foreshadowing of a greater sacrifice, a greater removal of sin, and a greater rescue that Jesus is about to um, bring about in not just Israel, but for the entire world. And this feast, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, provided an opportunity for the enemies of Jesus that we'll see here next. Verse 3, or excuse me, verse 2. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to put him to death because they were afraid of the people. We've seen the attitude of these religious leaders, especially as Jesus has come to Jerusalem. It started, it's actually started way back, but it really began to take shape when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, if you remember that story, it's from John chapter 12. So he raised Lazarus from the dead, and then he openly defied the authority of the religious leaders by throwing the money changers out of the temple. We saw that back in Luke chapter 19. What Jesus was saying is, I'm putting you on notice. I'm doing something so incredibly bigger than you could ever imagine that it's going to blow your socks off. That's sort of a Greek rendering, sockos, you know, there in the... Um, but he's also saying by throwing the money changers out, he's saying, I'm throwing this thing out that has become, come into the place between man and God. Because man had co-opted Judaism, which was again supposed to be a foreshadowing of what God was going to do. And it had become a man-centered religion, one full of rules and 
meant to keep men rich and in power. And Jesus said, I'm throwing you guys out on your ears. Well, that didn't sit well for some unknown reason with the religious leaders, and so they wanted to kill him. He was a threat to their power, but yet they feared the people because as Jesus came into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, the people, even if they didn't know what they were doing exactly, they declared him to be the Messiah. And so the religious leaders, the people loved Jesus at this point. The religious leaders were worried, hey, if we take this guy out in public, the people are going to riot. And if there's a riot, Rome doesn't like riots very well. And since Israel was occupied by Rome, if they let a riot come about, it was quite possible that the Roman authorities would come in and say, okay, that's it, boys. We're tossing you out on your ear, and we're going to take complete control. And so again, the religious leaders were worried about losing their power. So they tried publicly humiliating Jesus to try and remove that love that the people had for him. They tried to trap him in really tough spiritual, scriptural, and political dilemmas. Things they thought, there's no way. He goes this way, we've got him. He goes that way, we've got him. And instead, he went this way and completely obliterated their arguments. So they went back and they figured, you know, we better have a more subtle plan to get this guy. We need a more private venue. Because as you recall from last time, if you look back in 21 verse 38, it, it said all the people would come early in the morning to hear him in the temple complex. So Jesus would go out to Bethany at night. He would come back early in the morning and he would start teaching, and all the people would gather, so there was no opportunity for the religious leaders to arrest him. So they needed something else. They needed what's called actionable intelligence. They needed a spy, an inside man, in order to give them the movements of Jesus so they could get him at a time when the crowds were not around. And so who delivered them that inside man? None other than Satan himself. Look at verses 3 through 6 now. Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. He went away and discussed with the chief priests and temple police how he could hand him over to them. They were glad and agreed to give him silver. So he accepted the offer and started looking for a good opportunity to betray him to them when the crowd was not present. So, the plot thickens. Now in John chapter 13, we discover that Judas Iscariot had actually already decided to betray Jesus. This idea had been implanted in his mind by Satan, and Judas, as we know, ended up betraying him, of course, and then uh, after he realized that his betrayal had not accomplished what he was hoping that it would, he went out and hung himself. And Judas is really one of the only people that we ever know about from the scriptures who ended up going to a place called Gehenna or hell. Uh, because of his absolute betrayal, he became an enemy of Jesus. So here in Luke's Gospel, we find that not only was the idea implanted by Satan, but that Satan actually empowered Judas as well. It says that here in verse 3, Satan entered Judas. Now the Greek roots for the two words that make up that one Greek word for entered are the words come and into. So come into. I think it's quite possible that Luke is telling us here that Lucifer actually did possess Judas. But it took a willing mind. Judas went right along with that plan. Satan merely gave Judas what he already wanted in the first place. He gave them the, him the power to do that. He determined that he was an enemy of Jesus, and so Satan gave, gave him the power to act on it. Now, the devil already knew through his intelligence gathering and his working behind the scenes to inspire the murder of Jesus, that the religious leaders only needed that actionable intelligence. Judas then became a pawn in Satan's scheme to inspire the Jewish religious leaders to get rid of this usurper, Jesus. 
So Judas sneaks away. It says that he um, went away in disgust with the chief priests and the temple police. He went away for this clandestine meeting. Now, Matthew's gospel in chapter 26 tells us that Judas, when he went to the religious leaders, he actually asked them for money because Judas was filled with greed. He stole money from Jesus' purse, actually. And he said to them, what are you willing to give to me? The bargain that they came to was 30 pieces of silver. Now, Zechariah chapter 11 actually prophesies this event and the sum that was paid for Jesus' life. And that sum is actually very significant. In Exodus chapter 21, we learn that under the law of Moses, if an ox gores and kills a slave, then the owner of that ox is to repay the owner of the slave the sum of 30 pieces of silver. That then became the accepted price of a slave. There's a tremendous amount of, of a prophetical significance that takes place with that. And if you go to our website later on, calvarynewber.org, click on the notes from this study. There, I link to an article that has some really great information about it. Now, 30 pieces of silver wasn't a lot of money. And Jesus actually did call himself a slave in, in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, for instance. And that as a slave, he would become a ransom for many. That 30 pieces of silver sold Jesus into the hands of the religious leaders and into the plot of Satan. But the ransom price paid for our freedom was nothing less than his own life. So... It seems like at this point, events are spiraling out of control, right? It seems like Jesus is now hemmed in on every side. There's no way that he can escape. He's about to fall into a trap. Don't do it. It's kind of like those movies. I never go see them, but you always hear about them, right? With the horror movie where somebody, you know, it's a bunch of teenagers in an old house and somebody hears uh, a sound in the basement and, and somebody gets up alone and they're going to go check it out. And you're sitting there in the theater and going, no, don't do it. Don't go through that door. So it, in a way, that's kind of the feeling that you get here. Jesus, you've got to just get out of there. You're falling into a trap. But in actuality, it is Jesus as the master chess player he is thinking so many moves ahead of Judas, ahead of the religious leaders, and even ahead of Satan himself. So I want to stop here and I want to discuss a couple of different things that I think this portion of the uh, chapter, Luke chapter 22, reveals to us about the machinations of the enemy how our flesh deals into that, but then how God is overall under, uh, in, in total control of the situation. But the first thing that we need to understand is that Satan is more powerful than you are. He is way smarter than you. And he has many more resources than we often give him credit for. Now, as I mentioned last time, Paul the Apostle in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 talks about something that's very revealing about the enemy. He talks about Satan's devices and that we should not be ignorant of them. We need to be knowledgeable about his devices. Now, I think the mistake people make is that, that they think that means we need to be knowledgeable about Satan. And they start going looking for Satan under every rock. And, you know, you've got the demon of sitting in your chair too long and, you know, all this kind of stuff, which is silly. But we shouldn't be ignorant of the devices, the schemes, the means by which Satan tries to do his work in the world and in your life. Satan is very old. He is extremely intelligent. He has a vast network and a long history of being able to get humans to do what he wants. And what is that? What's the end game? And that is to get humans to trust themselves rather than entrust themselves into God's authority over their lives. So how does his devices, how do his devices work? Well, there is sort of a one end of the scale. Satan actually can, in certain circumstances, force things to happen. 
he can actually possess non-Christians. I believe that the Christian cannot be possessed by the devil. Um, I won't go into the scriptural basis for that, but he can possess a non-Christian. He can force them to do things against their will. We see that in the Gospels with the, the man who was possessed with a legion of demons in Luke chapter 8. Remember him? Got so strong he could break the chains. And then also there was a boy in Matthew chapter 17 who because he was possessed by a demon continually was thrown into the fire or thrown into the water. But the idea of Satan actually possessing a human and forcing them to do things is actually the exception rather the, than the rule. It's very rare. I think the most common device that the enemy uses actually comes from leveraging our own natural desires and leveraging the effects that the sin nature has on us, listen now, to make us think we are acting in our own best self-interest when in fact we are operating in his best self-interest. So how does this work? Well, it goes way back to the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, Luc Lucifer, another, another uh, word that's used for Satan, which, by the way, means light bringer, he came in the form of a serpent and introduced an idea into the mind of Eve. And he basically said to Eve that you should distrust what God says and two, you should trust in your sense instead of what is best. You should do that rather than trusting in God's authority over your life. This is the most common device of the enemy. Now, it works in two ways in our lives even today. The first way that this device works is that our view of what is right is actually altered by our sin nature. And that makes us very easily manipulated. Now the Apostle John talks about this. He says, for everything that belongs to the world, this age, the ruler of this age, Satan, everything that belongs to the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride in one's lifestyle is not from the Father, but is from the world. So, we're talking about our, our natural desires here, our God-given needs being satisfied in ungodly ways. That's the lust of the flesh. Our own blurred sense of what's right and what's real. That's the lust of the eyes. We can't see clearly. And our tendency to operate only in our self-interest. That's the pride in one's lifestyle. Those three things, our tendency to um, satisfy natural desires in unnatural ways, our inability to see clearly what's right and what's real, and the fact that the sin nature makes us operate in our own self-interest. We don't have that agape love, which is other-centered, self-sacrificing affection. Those three things together... Um, make us pretty easily manipulated by Satan. And many times he has to do nothing more than let sin take its natural course. So the natural course of sin then becomes one of the main devices of the enemy. The second thing is that we are, what we naturally want becomes empowered by the influence of the enemy, either directly or indirectly. And we see this happening in Judas. He'd already decided through the sin nature to betray Jesus, and then Satan empowered that decision and brought it about wreaking havoc in many people's lives. And that's what Satan tries to do with us as well. Now, I think, you know, as I said, I, I do not believe that Christians can be possessed by Satan. That does not mean they cannot be influenced by Satan. Now, this, this is a little bit on the edge, but I think that I'm actually in pretty good, uh, pretty solid ground in saying this. But I think that it is quite possible for Satan to whisper things into your ear, to implant thoughts. Now, it makes some sense to me when I read places like Acts chapter 5, verse 3. If you remember, that story is with Ananias and Sapphira. This was 
in the very early days of the church. They had a piece of property. They sold it for like $100,000. And that became what they got on their tithe because they came and they gave the property to the church. But they said they only sold it for 80000 So they pocketed, and I'm making up those numbers, of course, but they pocketed the extra, but making it look as if they had, had made this incredible donation. And Peter says to Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Now, Ananias, I believe, he was a believer. He was saved even though he died right there on the spot. But he was influenced to do something very bad, and he was influenced directly by Satan. So in Acts, Luke says, Satan has filled your heart. I think that's the action of Satan whispering things in your ear, empowering your own natural tendencies to follow the sin nature, to bring about a result that is against the Lord. Now, having said that, I think that a lot of church gossip and church division actually comes out of this. We feel maybe like somebody else has, has um, said something that we didn't like. Somebody said something that you know, hurt our pride. That's that natural tendency for security being fulfilled in an unnatural way because pride then causes us to react negatively to that person and we want to push them down and bring ourselves up. And then Satan comes along and says, you know, the best way, that person deserves to get hurt, don't they? Look what they did to you. Look how bad they made you feel. You know what you could do to really make them pay for what they did is you could go over to this person here and talk that person down and say some things. And, you know, you just kind of stretch the truth a little bit. And you make it a little bit worse than it was. And then that person goes to somebody over here and then pretty soon... You've got a gossip circle going. You've got people ha taking sides and the church is divided. So it's Satan taking those natural things and he's empowering them by influencing your thought life. So, lest we despair, lest we think, oh no, all is lost. We can't escape this trap. The second important point that I wanted to bring to us this morning is that God is more powerful than Satan, way more powerful. Now, there's, this, there's a concept I want to talk about. Let's put on your theological hats here for a moment, and I want you to follow this with me. There's a concept in the scriptures that we see over and over that God uses in his ultimate control, and that is evil judging evil. Now, you see it in 1 Kings chapter 22, where the prophet Micaiah reveals this scene in heaven where the demons have come before the Lord and the Lord gives a demon permission to become a lying spirit in the mouths of the prophets. Now, why did he do that? He did that so that this evil demon could uh, bring about judgment on an evil king whose name was Ahab. We also see it in Judges chapter 7, verse 1. Remember Gideon? Gideon and his massive army of 300 men come against the Midianites because God was judging the Midianites. They were the enemy of Israel. And if you know the story, of course, uh, Gideon comes along and his 300 men, they have a, a, uh, a torch in one hand uh, covered up by a jar and then they break the, the jars, and so there are all these lights, and they shout, you know, for Gideon, and, and uh, they rush into the camp, and it says that when they blew, so, sorry, they had a, a torch in one hand covered by a jar and a trumpet in the other. I always find that interesting. Where were their swords? Uh, you know, and boy, there's a lot of, like, significance we could make over that. They broke the jars, and then the, the torches were lit. And that's really, I think, a, a significance of either worship or of shining out the character of Christ in a dark world. And then the trumpet is like the, the clarion call of the gospel. So much more powerful than using uh, the you know, swords, the arguments, the I'm going to, you know, you're going to turn or burn or anything like that. So, you know, in terms of the power of God, the character of a person living in, uh, godly in Christ Jesus and sharing the gospel is so much more powerful. Anyway, so they come rushing into the camp and it says when they blew the 300 trumpets, that would be a sound, wouldn't it? Now look at this. 
the, the Lord set every man's sword against his comrade and against all the army. So the Midianites basically slaughtered their own army. So God caused evil to judge evil. So, who was in control here? It wasn't the demons, and it wasn't the Midianites, and it wasn't Ahab in these stories. It was God. And here in Luke's gospel, despite the machinations of the enemy using and influencing evil men to do his desire, it is God who is in total control. In 1 Kings, it was God who gave permission for that demon to become a lying spirit. In Job, for instance, it's God who gives Satan permission to ruin Job's life, but ultimately God's plan comes about. So God will leverage the leveragers. He'll get them in the end to do exactly what he wants, and he will judge their evil in the process, and he will do that for you as well. To illustrate... Let me share two verses with you. And if you're a note taker, write down Isaiah chapter 54, verse 17. You've probably heard this verse before. Where God declares, no weapon formed against you will succeed. And you will refute any accusation raised against you in court. This is the heritage of the Lord's servants, and their righteousness is from me. This is the Lord's declaration. The second verse I want to share with you is out of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation, this could be called one of those weapons, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to humanity. God is faithful and he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape so that you are able to bear it so two things for us at least i'll just you know, I'll, I'll keep it to two one you will fail satan will accuse you but his weaponry his temptations his accusations they are useless in the face of the cross of jesus christ all your failures, Jesus died for. All your sins, he paid the price for. And his mission accomplished on the, Christ, on the cross completely ruined the devices of Satan and the weapons that he has formed against you. Secondly then, when temptation comes, and notice how Paul says it overtakes you. It's kind of like I'm just walking along, doing my own thing, serving the Lord, and all of a sudden, boom, a temptation overtakes me. I feel like I've been taken advantage of, and you have been. When those temptations come, here's what I want you to do. Look for the way out. It's like you're driving down the freeway, and a temptation comes along, and the Lord provides an exit ramp right here. And um, I used the story of one time when I was first using a GPS. Um, this was several years ago. Now, of course, you know, you got Waze and everything else just right on your phone. But I had this cool GPS device on this little sticker up in my windshield. And I was going up to visit my son and daughter-in-law in Portland. And I was driving up 205. And I had their address put in the GPS. And it kept saying, exit, you know, number 12. Exit number 12A. Exit number 13. I kept going, what is this thing talking about? Why is it having me exit the freeway? I'm, I know what I'm doing. I'm coming up the freeway. And then is when I discovered the standstill. The GPS had, trying to, had was trying to get me off the freeway to take surface streets because there had been a crash further up the freeway and it was at a complete standstill. And I ended up being super late for our um, time with our son and daughter-in-law. Had I heeded the warnings of the GPS and taken that off-ramp, I would have been fine. And so, too, as we're going along in our life, Satan will put temptations, and this is why I really encourage us to have situational awareness of our weaknesses, our tendencies. How does the enemy get you to fall? You know how that works in your own life. Put those things more into your conscious mind. Have situational awareness when that temptation comes Look for the off-ramp, because that's what Paul is promising here. 
with the temptation, he will provide a way of escape. That word means to exit. That's why I use the freeway. So it's literally, it could be, for instance, just stopping yourself in your tracks. You're about to say or do something. Just stop. Stop right there. Be aware of what you're about to do and just stop at that moment. It could be then reaching out to a friend to ask them to pray for you, somebody that you're connected with, somebody that understands and supports you. It could be turning, turning yourself to worship instead of letting the, 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 your mind be filled with what was going on and tempting you. Let your mind be filled with worship or perhaps God's word instead of that temptation. Sometimes it's just the simple mindfulness of what you are being tempted to do that can be enough to break you free from it. So what's the alternative to that? Here are two things I want to leave us with this morning. First is James chapter 4, verse 7. Submit to God, but resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So there are two things embedded there. We're going to undo what Satan influenced Eve to do way back in the Garden of Eden. Because Eve submitted herself to Satan's authority and stood with him and was joined with him and then became his servant. But because of the cross of Jesus Christ, we can now submit ourselves to God and we can resist the devil. That word there in the Greek means to stand against. It's like building a wall that is keeping the earth from coming through or water. It is standing against something. You take a stand against the devil by saying, I don't belong to you. I belong to God and I'm going to put myself under his authority. I would encourage you to practice that, to perfect it, to use it often in your life out loud saying, here comes the temptation. I don't belong to you anymore, Satan. You can speak in my mind all you want, but I am standing against you, and I am submitting myself to God's authority in my life. The scriptures tell us you are not, you are not your own. You have been bought with a price. You belong to the Lord if you have made Jesus your Lord and Savior. And the more you stand against Satan and submit yourself to God's authority, the easier it becomes to stand against those temptations that come into your life. The easier it is to not be manipulated and used by the enemy. Okay, let's pray. And Lord, I pray that, I, I, I just know it, that this week, following this study, we're all going to be tempted pretty sorely. So, sorry about that, folks. But I just pray, Lord, that right now you would give us that awareness of ourselves, an awareness of the devices of the enemy, and, a, and an awareness of your power, that you leverage the leveragers, that there's no weapon formed against us that will stand but that with the temptation you will provide a way of escape. Help us to see that off-ramp, Lord, that exit, and help us to take it every time. Make us strong in our submission to you and, our strong, in our, and strong in our stance against the enemy. We thank you for this, Lord. And just with eyes closed and heads bowed at this moment, if you have not made Jesus your Lord, if he has not um, paid for your sins, if you've not placed yourself under his mercy by by acknowledging the fact that you have sinned and fallen short of his glory of his character and said lord i'm, I'm turning from these things because i know that they aren't like you and i pray that you would forgive me according to the mercy that you obtained for us by paying for my sins on the cross become my lord become my savior if you've not done that you have no hope in fighting against being used and manipulated by the enemy and not only that you have no hope for a future beyond being owned by someone who wants nothing more than to see you suffer escape from that it's so easy you know i say it's easy it's not easy to let go of that which we have held on to our whole lives i did it and i am never ever for all of eternity will regret regret it and i pray today that you would make that decision as well to give your life to jesus christ he is the most loving caring kind beautiful pure person you will ever ever meet he wants to get to know you he wants to come into you he wants to fellowship with you and he wants to change you from something that is um, manipulated by the enemy to someone who is used by the holy spirit 
So make that decision today. And Lord, I pray that everyone within the sound of my voice would make that decision to follow you. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.